I never actually went to school for animation. I got my degree in physics, which hasn't done me a lot of good. Except, well, I, I had a job for a year, which the pain and suffering probably inspired a lot of comedy. I just started doing it. I got some books on it, and I bought an old camera and just started messing around with it. I was really trying to get into comedy. I wasn't trying to get a job as an animator. I knew it wasn't good enough, but I thought, I used to go to all the animation festivals, and I would see see shorts that were well animated and some that were funny but weren't well animated and I just thought I might be able to get something in an animation festival. Right off the bat I made two animated shorts. One was uh, a character What's Milton that I later made that used in this movie Office Space. We'll Actually the original short was called Office Box. Space and then I did another one that was just kind of like a fat redneck guy watching a health food commercial and I did these two together just really cheap. Oh. There's that stapler I've been looking for here. Um, Let me but, just go ahead and get that from you. Thanks. Well. Okay, so uh, if you could go ahead and just get to that as soon as possible, that'd be terrific. Well. All right. Thanks a bunch, Milton. Okay. Bye bye. Well. And so I had this VHS tape with two cartoons in it, and I just mailed a bunch of them. I just called information. Like uh, I felt really stupid. I was in Dallas. Uh, outside of Dallas, Texas, and I just, uh, MTV, please, and just got the address and just sent about 15 of them out, and within a couple weeks, I got all these calls. It was, it was amazing, and I was like, I don't know how old I was, 27, 28, and I just thought, man, I should have done this when I was 19. When I'm drawing in sketchbooks, for some reason, I just tend to draw a lot of, like, middle-aged white guy Bubba's, like that we call them in Texas. I'd had this idea for a long time of just like, I don't know, four guys standing around drinking beers. I ended up doing a kind of a panel cartoon of just the four guys with their beers all saying, yep, 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 and then Boomhauer thinking, yep. That first drawing I did is, is pretty close to what's, you know, what you see at the beginning of King of the Hill. Yep. 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 Mm-hmm. I'd already done a first draft of the pilot and the drawings, and Fox met with me to talk about doing a show to follow The Simpsons. I kind of pitched that as, you know, that these four guys would be kind of like a Greek chorus originally was the way it was going to be, you know. And yeah, they were, it started as those four guys and the drawing of the family and just a drawing of Bobby I had. The network had a bunch of notes, and I was off doing the Beavis and Butthead movie, and actually, my management just suggested that I uh, get someone in to, to help out and take it on to the next level. I loved Mike's script. I thought it, it was very original and um, very funny, and it, and it had this authentic world that I hadn't seen on TV. And, the, and Mike's um, writing style and his drawing style are kind of, of a piece, and they're really based on real life and observing great details in people. And I pretty much knew that I could fix what the executive's issues were, um, and that once I was done fixing them, we would have this terrific show, which was a character comedy, but with realistic tone, filled with characters that you hadn't seen before. I grew up in New York City, and my father, Aaron Daniels, I guess I get my sense of humor from, he grew up in rural Massachusetts during World War II, and then was raising my family uh, in New York in the 70s. So there was kind of a culture clash there that uh, Hank uh, is sort of going through too. So I signed on to rewrite it, and first thing I did was go to Texas to talk to Mike. This is Texas. I wanted to figure out his vision for the show, and also see what he was observing with that kind of observational humor. You gotta find out what is actually being observed. So he took me all around Austin and showed me all the neighborhoods that he thought Hank would live in and the different little propane dealers around that area, hypermarts and stuff like that. So I got an idea of what the place was like. And then I went back to LA and I started to address the script. And um, basically, I didn't really want to change Hank that much. So what I did was change everything that was around Hank started with Dale and turned him into a uh, kind of right-wing conspiracy nut. Then uh, I also added a wife that was cheating on him, really obviously, but he couldn't, he couldn't see it. That led to having Joseph, which was good because he was a friend for Bobby to talk to. Then also I gave Hank a really unreasonable, unnurturing dad 
so that you felt that, well, at least Hank's doing better than his dad. And then I added Luann, uh, which was basically to make more out of Hank's discomfort with sexuality. So basically all those changes uh, kind of moderated Hank and pushed him more towards a good old boy. And that was the, the basic rewrite. After uh, Greg had done the rewrite, we had this idea of doing a pencil test to just so they could see animation. The point of it was to give the network something to see on its feet, something that looked like the show. Because in animation, it takes nine months to get a whole episode back. And so we didn't, we couldn't do a pilot and then wait another nine months and do a show if they picked it up. We had to, it was all resting on this two or three minute pencil test. We were going to do a section from the script and then we decided to just do a thing of Hank actually pitching himself directly to John Matoyan, who's the president of the network at the time. Well, Mr. Matoyan, I'd say y'all got the makings of a damn good cartoon here. I mean, you got my wife, Peggy, and I'm real proud of my boy, Bobby, because he, uh, uh, well, because he's my boy. And Luann's living with us now. She'll probably be real good for ratings, the way she dresses. Of course, uh, I got my neighbors, too. Dale, Bill, and old Boomhauer. And it worked like a dream. <laughs> and they, uh, they picked the show up based on the script and the pencil test. Oh, and uh, I got some ideas for advertisers, if you put us on the air. Uh, trucks, pork rinds, we eat a lot of those in our house. Barbecue sauce, uh, Jensen's blood dough balls. That's a fishing bait. You don't want to eat those. The casting of an animated show, I think, is, is really important and kind of underrated. The voice really drives a lot of it, a lot more than people think for an animated show. To make animation really work, it's just important to make the look of the character and the voice match, make it sound like the voice is coming out of that character. And the first time I, I, I thought it really came together on King of the Hill was actually Dale, Johnny Hardwick doing Dale. You know what they say Ford stands for, don't you? stands for fix it again Tony <laughs> well I was uh, hired as a writer on this show I kind of sat in on a bunch of auditions and they had seen some tapes of me I used to do stand-up and Mike said he might be interested in me doing a voice and I kind of locked into this Dale guy that was sort of the only thing I wanted to audition for after because in the pilot script he's just talking about the government and I was really sort of into that myself hey I know what's wrong with your truck it's your quote unquote pollution controls I heard on talk radio you don't even need them they're just an egghead government plot. I kind of locked into this guy after looking at him of this sort of William S. Burroughs sort of thing. And sort of like a guy who thinks he's sort of a Nicholson-like, like he thinks he's really cool. So I just kind of started going from that attitude. And it just kind of, you know, I guess it worked. The casting process was pretty different for actors because one of the things we did was we never looked at the actors. And um, we had these cutouts of Mike's drawings of the characters. and. Uh, I would basically put the cutout right in front, so I, I would watch the cutout and listen to the actor, which I think some of them found a little odd. Guess who? I have something special planned for tonight. <gasps> Bobby! Mom! <laughs> this process it was very different because they literally they closed their eyes. They did not want to look at us. They looked at the, the sketches on the wall while we spoke, and they didn't record the auditions at all, which was something that I'm not used to. I mean, I'm used to going in and being put on tape, and then somebody who I've never met hires me. This was purely on being in the moment and seeing how it worked, you know, with the face. I remember Pam came in and read when Greg and I were both there, and uh, she got... She got up and uh, just had this kind of like, yeah, yeah, like we said, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, right, great, yeah, and now you guys will call someone else. Yeah, see you later. <laughs> I just gave him a few and I said, pick one. Yo, Sharice, you Stone Cold Fox, what up? I'm a substitute Spanish teacher. Los estudiantes son mis amigos. Something about the way Kathy plays Peggy, I think, kind of inspired the writing. It's like this feedback loop that gets going, and I think that character really came to life, and she ended up becoming one of my favorite characters. The first voice that I did at the first audition was an improv, and that's the voice that stayed to this day, and I have no idea where it came from. I like to do little improv games with the actors, and for example, the second episode uh, where Peggy teaches sex ed, 
basically came out of an improv game where I would ask all the Peggies to pretend that they were Peggy, you know, the character is a Texas woman, and that they were a substitute teacher and they were suddenly asked to teach sex ed and they weren't aware of it. And so they all had fun with that. I got the script and in it was Peggy's sort of journey to saying parts of the body that she's, private parts that she'd been shy of saying. And so, um, like, it was really hard for her to say penis, so she'd start out with happiness. Happiness. Hap penis. Hap penis. I did it. Vagina! <laughs> and that I got to scream vagina on the top of my lungs the second episode, I knew that I was home. I knew that I was in the right place. That would have been a completely different character if Kathy wasn't doing the voice, I, I can guarantee it. Honey, bring me my BC headache powder and a glass of water. All right, I... I wasn't sure if I wanted to do any voices on it in the beginning, and um, I think Greg wasn't sure if I if he wanted me doing any voices either. What happened was we just kind of like, he had done some casting and I didn't like the, the stuff I had heard and so originally it was just, okay, I'll do the voice for the pencil test and see how it goes. And it just kind of, just kind of fell into it. Hey, oh, wait, man, I did, it ain't gonna work out, man. These little gals come around here, they get that flat out no, man. Boomhauer, the, the idea for the character and the voice came first. When Beavis and Butthead was a show, I got a voicemail from a guy and he thought the name of the show was Porky's Butthole. And I don't know how you get that out of Beavis and Butthead. Well, the butt, obviously, but. <laughs> And he left this long message that I just kept playing over and over again. I just loved it. It was like, he'd say, uh, well, I've been calling y'all for better month now. Grab about y'all every time them dang old loon tunes come on. Y'all put on them pokey's freaking old butthole. And it took me a long time to kind of figure out what, I think he was complaining that the show had too many commercials and that he didn't like the show. And um, at one point he said, well, I guess I'm gonna have to call the FCC about shutting y'all's butt down. And, uh, I just, I liked the way that you could, I like those guys where you kind of know what they're talking about, but the, they have the idea of what they want to say, but the words are just not keeping up with, their mouth isn't keeping up with their brain. Sir, do you know anything about this? Yeah, man, I'll tell you what, dude, one of them snap punch last night, man, with them stick in the bag, and them quack, quack, man, if he'd go woo-loo, talking about that big mistake, y'all, right there in that cooler. This beauty school homework is hard, Aunt Peggy. Brittany Murphy, she was almost the only one who did a Luann that made it worth doing the character because she was so real and interesting and never what you expected. Almost everybody else that tried out made her a ditzy, dumb blonde. And Brittany brought all these interesting levels to it that just made it a real interesting character. Luann is a typical trailer trash teenager. <laughs> she is a joy to be. She's bright and she lightens up all the dark corners of my head. She like comes from the 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 brightest most corner of my brain. She's very happy and joyous and very hysterical. Look, Aunt Peggy, I got my practice head. It's got real hair and everything. Well, Luann, it's a very nice head. Don't touch it! Yeah, I know. You know, I feel for that kid. I remember when I was starting out as a young barber, I felt so alone. Nobody cares, Bill. Bill Dotrieve is pretty much like this. <laughs> Bill likes Peggy, but Peggy doesn't like Bill very much. <laughs> I'm so depressed I can't even blink. I auditioned first for Dale. You know, it just didn't feel right to me, and let's try Bill, and Bill seemed to be a much better fit for me. Mike was, at that time, in Austin. He wasn't available for those auditions, but uh, as I remember it, uh, we did it over the phone, so I, I read probably, you know, maybe 50 seconds of something that Bill did and listening over the speakerphone, there's you know, no no noise at all and, and I hear over the speakerphone after I'm done, I hear, well, that was about as funny as that could be, <laughs> in kind of a Hank's thing and uh, he said, so I uh, got the job. Sounds like your horn's going off. You really think so, Bill? Oh, yeah. Where are its legs? What are you looking at, Mo? A Japanese machine gun blew my shins off in WW2. Toby Haas was a pretty outrageous guy. Uh, 
who does the voice of Khan and Cotton. I was in New York, and uh, they just called me up over the phone, and they said, well, just try something kind of angry and, and loud. And then I came out to LA, and I did it, and it was just kind of like a, a little bit of kind of a Ross Perot-ish sort of. Well, it's kind of mean, I'm nasty, but loud the whole time. So he just screams a lot. Hey, Missy, how about some sandwiches? <laughs> <laughs> in animation, first there's a script. A lot of the first season episodes were based on, a couple of them were treatments that I had written and that Greg had written. In the first season, a lot of the shows were stuff that Mike and I had prepared for the pitch. We had to come in with six ideas when we pitched it. So, for example, the boggle thing was uh, an idea that I had had. Mike had had this idea about the snipe hunt, and the thing with Khan had come out of his pilot. I am Khan Supanusimpon. Hmm, so that's pronounced Khan, right? As the show went on, the writers contributed more and more, and a lot of times they would come in with a fully formed story. But whatever it is, it starts with an idea, and we bat it around, and we talk about it in the writing room and we kind of zero it down and shape it. What I ended up doing a lot of was just writing memos and things about like, I think this would work better this way. And you know, like just meeting in a room and just talking it through and trying to get the story nailed down. We'll have a plan, like I don't want this scene, I do want this scene, I want a new scene about this, I like this joke, I don't like this joke, you know, can we beat this? And a lot of times, um, it works best if you're very democratic and you trust the taste of the other writers. We hadn't premiered yet, so we had to do the whole season before anybody knew whether we'd be successful or not. So that led the, the executives to feel, I think, pretty free about giving a lot of writing notes. So what would happen is we would have a table reading on Friday, we'd get a ton of notes on stuff, and then the Monday and the Tuesday of the following week, we would, we would often be up very late trying to get it ready for the table reading on Wednesday. You gotta stop and smell the rose sometime. Don't be such tight A's. <laughs> so on a table read, uh, we have all the actors there. Um, we have uh, some network executives and studio executives and the entire writing staff and the other staff members of the show. And uh, basically, the more the merrier. Try and pack the room, because um, say you have a, a you know, some little wisp of a joke that a lot of people aren't paying attention on. If the, if the room is filled, uh, you know, you get a laugh off it. I probably shouldn't mention these kind of trade secrets. <laughs> That's ridiculous. You are so going, I won't hear another word about it. It's just a dumb party. A dumb party with girls. Well, I don't like girls. And face twitches. <laughs> Peg, honey, close the screen door. <laughs> and we do another rewrite. And then it's recorded with all the actors in this building using this vast array of knobs. Hey, I've got an idea. Let's have lunch at that place we used to go to when we smoked. You know, with the jazz combo. When we smoke. Oh, Smokey? Yeah, that's the one. I direct the voices, uh, and uh, that's, you know, a lot of fun, but that's a whole different thing. And uh, it's really the easiest part of being a director because you can just sit on your butt and they, they are standing there like a radio show in front of microphones and you go, oh, louder, softer, funnier. Okay, let's try it one more time. Okay. All right. Roll, please. We're rolling in deck number 13. Scene four, take two. Action. Listen, son, everybody's heard the government's lying about the dangers of tobacco, but that's only half the story. Open up your eyes, man. Nobody talks about those poor scientists in Brazil and their experiment saving fruit bats' lives with cigarettes. You edit the soundtrack down to be about a 19-minute track, and it gets sent to our animation production company, which is Film Roman. I'm the supervising director of the project. I directed the pilot episode and help in the overall details of the, of the picture and what the characters are like. Wes Archer was the very first supervising director on the show. And he also pretty much was the show designer, the main character designer, the background designer. Wes was, in a lot of ways, the, uh, the initial visual artist for the show. Him and Mike worked closely and with Greg to develop the show's overall look. Initially, there were eight Mike Judge designs for characters. The animators take his drawings and 
make them look nice. If there's any changes he wants to make, we make changes and we come up with a lot of new character designs as the show requires. Basically what I'm doing now is um, designed for secondary characters in the show. Um, characters other than the main characters that appear like in the background or uh, characters with lines and that sort of thing. And uh, what they're looking for in the show is, is a high level of realism. So we look through, um, through photographs of regular everyday people and uh, draw them to make them as real as possible. This is what's called a storyboard show. The amount of animation we do here at the facility is very minimal, but very important, small bits of animation. The production of the show is done through a storyboard and it's animated overseas. First we would get the script from 20th Century Fox. That would be delivered to the director and himself and two other guys, probably his AD and one storyboard guy, would break the script down. The show is boarded out. Usually we have three to four hundred scenes per show. I'm a storyboard artist here. I take the scripts and uh, take what's written here. You turn it into roughs, but essentially it's for placement and pacing so you know how the story is going to play out. The, the storyboard is actually uh, thinking more than drawing because, like you can see, it's uh, quick, simple drawings. It's picking the shot and uh, what angle you're going to be shooting from, it's a close-up or far away. So a lot of this is in the head. That in turn is handed to the layout artists who take those storyboard drawings, blow them up, that would give you your comp to start the actual animation drawing. I do backgrounds for King of the Hill, background layout, and uh, basically what happens is uh, we get this, what is generated from a storyboard, and it comes from layout where they put all the characters together and then I'll rough out a background. After your layout is all done, it then goes to a timer. The timer does a, a rough pass. Uh, usually dialogue and action would dictate the length of a scene. That in turn would get scanned and go to animatics where basically a pencil test is put together. Basically what we do is we get a uh, drawings from the layout floor and we get an audio track. We scan in all the drawings, put them in order, uh, and for the duration they're supposed to be on, and we create a rough version of the show, black and white, just the key poses, so they can check the timing and the acting and all that before they make uh, changes before they have it colored. Hey, John Redcorn. Hank, Dell, Bill, Boomhauer. John Redcorn, we've got this Order of the Straight Arrow retreat tomorrow, and I was wondering... I'd be honored to look after your wife. Oh, well... Gee, thanks. And in turn would be screened to Greg and Fox and Mike Judge. And then it would be sent to Korea. And Korea does the in-betweening and the coloring and the photography. You shoot it on film, it comes back to us, we put the sound on and got you a little TV show. That moment when I knew it was going to be okay, I was at the rental car place in L.A. There was a guy working there who didn't speak English real well, but he started, he recognized my name. Like, he, he said, oh, King of the Hill, that's like with the lawnmowers and the guy. And, and he started laughing, talking about it. And I was like, wow, if it's, you know, if it's like, if that guy likes it, that's doing something right. <laughs>